Today's episode is sponsored by Coros. Coros is the leading customer engagement platform. From social media to online communities to digital customer care, Coros helps companies authentically connect with customers. Coros connects consumer insights across departments and helps companies run their businesses with their customers, anticipating their needs and accelerating sales. Coros works with over 2,000 brands, including 52 of the interbrand 100 companies and powers over 500 million digital interactions every day. Check them out at coros.com. That's K-H-O-R-O-S dot com. Hello and welcome to the shiny new object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so I have the pleasure and the privilege of interviewing one of our industry's leaders and this week is absolutely no different. I'm on a Zoom call uh, from my spare room with Sonica Patel who is Vice President Marketing at Danone North America. Sonic, at 7 a.m. where you are. I, I can't believe that. <laughs> yes, indeed. Bright and early. Well, look, I really appreciate you getting up so early to fit this in. So could you just give the audience a bit of an overview of who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Sonica Patel, um, and I am the Vice President of Marketing um, at Danone North America. Um, in my current role at Danone, I've been tasked with transforming some of the brands within our yogurt portfolio, notably Activia, um, by breakthrough innovation, um, you know, elevating the brand love um, with the right positioning and the right marketing mix, um, and really leveraging innovative marketing techniques to, um, you know, elevate the relevance of the brands in today's uh, day and age. Um, so that's essentially like the breadth of my work, but um, I've really been a CPG um, life for, for a very long time with 15 years in this industry. Um, and I started my journey uh, with Ogilvy, you know, leading Cadbury. And uh, after a few years in advertising, switched over to the client side, worked for um, Record Bank Keeser, uh, leading Lysol. Um, oddly enough, I was running their wipes and hand soap business, which are probably the hottest brands right now in this environment. Uh, you know, who knew hand washing and disinfection would be trending. Um, but uh, after a few years on that side, I spent some time at PepsiCo um, as well, working on Mountain Dew and their uh, trademark Pepsi brand. So been pretty, uh, pretty much CPG for a very long time and, and now spending time at Danone. Um, you know, leading their uh, their Activia brand. What was the thing that made you switch from agency to go brand side? Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. Um, I think for me, the drive was more to be closer to consumers. Um, and as um, an advertising person, I felt like I was more on the execution end where I was bringing, um, you know, consumer insights to life with beautiful uh, creative thinking. Um, and I think what I was missing was that connection with consumers. Are you a marketing book person? Are you a big reader? Yeah, yeah. So Tom, one of my favorite books that I recommend all the time is um, Simon Sinek's Start With The Why. Uh, you know, it's a classic and it's a great read on so many levels. Um, you know, um, as a leader, like you really want to inspire your team and lead them in a way that they, you know, feel inspired and go home with a powerful sense of achievement, right? Um, as a brand marketer, you want to define what's the right purpose for your brand that connects with consumers. And even on a personal level, I think the book is quite powerful because every story will kind of, you know, give your, um, you know, force you to think, uh, think about things differently with a different perspective and, you know, raise your eyebrow and like, wow you so i think it's certainly one of the classic ones that i i certainly recommend a lot if someone wasn't going to read that book but was keen yeah. to take away the insights from that book what would you say was the, the key message or messages in that that you could just pass on to someone you know the the model of um, the golden circle that simon talks about and he introduced us to where he encourages us to think about the why and so the way the golden circle is defined is that you know really most often times consumers or people think with the what and then they think about the how and then 
at the center of it all is the why. And so, you know, one of the striking examples in the book, which I think will illustrate the point, um, is, you know, Apple. You know, it's, it's certainly one of the most loved brands um, in the industry today. And, you know, if, if that brand was something that started... Um, you know, with the traditional mindset of the what, you know, they would approach um, you by saying, hey, uh, we make great computers. Um, the how would be that they design beautiful computers um, and they would ask you, do you want to buy one, right? Um, but I think the striking difference in the approach with the golden circle is that they start with the why. They tell people, that Apple is somebody who believes in challenging status quo. And we're challenging that status quo by designing beautiful products. Um, and we happen to make computers. Do you want to buy one? So what has been the best investment of your time, energy, or money in, in the last few years? You know, so the best advice or philosophy that I've learned is from the ex-CEO of PepsiCo, Indra Nui, and I heard her speak in one of the forums where she said, you know, you should be a lifelong student. Um, And so I think for me, the best investment for my career has been those that lead to that learning. Um, And I believe like learning from each other's experiences and other stories is quite valuable, you know, um, except for the lessons you, of course, learn from yourself and your, um, your own mistakes, etc. But, um, you know, especially cross pollinating thoughts with people from other industries have often inspired me, you know, to think provocatively. My personal struggle with learning is when and how to fit it in and how to prioritize it. Like I've done things like, put it in your calendar right i'm gonna do reading between seven and a half seven every day or i'm gonna you know go every week i'm gonna have a coffee with an interesting person but then work gets in the way right life happens so what are the tools and techniques you have for making sure that you learn yeah that's a great question because you know you're absolutely right that life does get in the way where it always is a priority right um and so it's extremely hard um and i think i did use some of the same techniques as you mentioned of you know blocking away time um, in my calendar or intentionally, um, you know, making time over the weekend to read. Um, however, you know, it's, it's difficult to practice that very consistently. So what advice would you give to people who are new to the industry? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Dom, because it takes me back to the days when I was a student and I was doing my MBA. And, you know, I actually came from India to the U.S. to do my MBA. Um, and, uh, like most people, I thought life was going to be like Hollywood when I came to the U S and I was going to have the best time of my life, sit around a couch with my friends, drinking coffee and discussing my terrible love life. <laughs> uh, so, but it was nothing like that. Um, and so, cause I was looking for a job in a post recessionary period. Um, I was an international student and a woman of color looking for a job in marketing in the U S. So there was absolutely nothing in my favor at that time. Um, and my batchmates and my seniors advised me that, you know, you're never going to get a job in brand marketing. You should probably look for something else and make sure you have a job. And uh, the only problem with that was that I loved brands so much and I was so passionate about advertising um, that I somehow, you know, felt okay with people turning me down, right? So there were a lot of times where I would reach out to people, cold call, just to can, kind of get some advice or thoughts. And I, would, I was often, uh, you know, I would not get responses, but um, I just kept going at it. I kept bouncing back until I got my first break. Right. So my biggest advice to people will be that and students especially is find out what you're passionate about and don't be shy to reach out. Right. Uh, Cold calling might not work 100 percent of the times, but you don't really need it to work 100 percent. You just need it to work, you know, one or two percent. And what's the worst that can happen? Um, There is really no downside to it. There's only upside. You sounded pretty rejection proof at that point, which is great. You had your strong belief. You had your why. You know, you you loved advertising. You want to be part of the the world of brands in some way. But how did you deal with rejection? How did you keep yourself focused? What I did was I would give myself tasks, right? And I 
focused more on the actions that I could take um, and really kept going at it. And that was really like my persistence, I think, was probably was the best asset at the time. As well as getting up at seven in the morning to do podcasts and mentoring um, your, your team and people that are new to the industry, you, you must have a lot of work on. You must suffer from overwhelm at some point. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that happens all the time. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And CPG especially is quite fast paced. Um, so there is a lot going on all the time. Um, and uh, what I really try to do is take a pause and actually try to distract my mind and do things that energize me. So, it, and it really helps me collect my thoughts and bounce back. Um, you know, so physical activity really helps me energize. Um, and what I do is, you know, I'd often lean onto things that I enjoy, like I, I would go to play squash um, or I would go for a swim. So, you know, often before like a big meeting, if I'm overwhelmed or nervous, I'll, I'll go for a swim the day before or really like try to distract or take a break with a game of squash with my husband. Uh, you know, it's certainly another level of fulfillment when I beat him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's a sense of another joy. Um, it puts me right back on track. <laughs> If you love all things innovation and want to understand how brands plan to emerge stronger from the current situation, don't forget to check out Madfest London on the 11th and 12th of November. My good friend Dan at Madfest knows how to put on a cracking event and there's always plenty of amazing speakers, beer and cool people to meet. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. Earlier we were discussing that your shiny new object was sound branding or sonic identity. Now, I think I know what that is, but it'd be great if you could tell the listeners what is your take on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, as marketers, we pay a lot of attention um, to how our brands show up visually. And I think we all understand what really it means to have a design language and a design DNA. But, uh, you know, as the world is evolving and, um, you know, the technology uh, in the voice uh, and the voice technology department is evolving with the likes of Alexa and Google Home, um, I think, you know, as brand owners and brand leaders, we will start to pay more attention to how we sound um, and what is that audio recognition that sparks that feeling of uh, familiarity and association with your brand. And so the way I would define, um, you know, sonic identity or sound branding is, uh, you know, what is that DNA, that sound DNA that defines your brand? Um, so just like how you would have design guidelines for and have a design logo. Similarly, um, you know, there are ways to create a sound mnemonic or sonic mnemonic. Uh, <laughs> if we all need a tongue twister. Um, in, you know, in, um, in the way you sound. And the easiest example to explain that is um, by leveraging some of the brands that have actually been ahead of the curve doing the sonic branding. Um, so for example, McDonald's is quite a classic one, right? They've been at it for years where they started with a jingle um, and a very um, iconic sound, um, uh, uh, you know, music, which is, you know, like I'm going to sing it for you now, but it, the, the way it goes is, uh, I don't think I said it right, but I think that's, that's the point of, you know, uh, why people get paid to do this <laughs> a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so th that's exactly what a sonic branding is. And, you know, they've consistently used that sound in every, every touch point of their communication, just like there is a consistent golden arch for their brand logo. Um, and I think that's the easiest way to explain what, the, what a sound brand or a sound logo it, uh, is. Why are you interested in this? Where is the this passion for sonic branding come from? Yeah, yeah. I think for me, you know, I I've always aspired to do something that you know is different and it's innovative and uh, something that sparks a deeper connection with consumers, right? And music and sound actually play such an important role, not just to evoke emotions, but most importantly, establish trust with brands. Um, and for me, that is quite inspiring because it's extremely hard for brands um, to build that trust. And um, often as brand marketers, you feel limited with this, 
the real estate that you have on your pack or the length of the video asset, you know, there's limitation. Uh, but with sound, you know, the power of sound goes beyond. And so I think for me, that was quite an inspiring space. And I did, I did uh, make an attempt to do something like this for Pepsi last year, where I was first introduced to this. Um, and I made an attempt to create a Pepsi jingle and a new mnemonic for the brand. Um, and so I think that was quite an experience for me where I feel like that's certainly something that I would, I would want more brands and all of my brands that I lead eventually to, um, you know, to have a sound DNA um, and really make it a native as part of the integrated marketing model to have, um, have a sound uh, logo. And especially now, right? Because uh, the times that we're in, people are yearning for a conversation and their reliance on the Alexas and the Google Homes of the world is more dominant than it was ever before. Can you give me a sense of how much this needs to cover and how broad can it go? Uh, you know, just like you would approach a design um, exercise, right? Like you want to identify first what are the brand values and what are those emotions and what are those... Um, uh, you know, uh, attributes about the brand that you want to evoke in the design, right? Something that's vibrant, colorful, um, that's easy to understand because it's design, it's visual. Um, similarly, for, the, for sound, you want to understand what are the emotions that you want to evoke with your sound, right? So is it trust? Is it uh, energy? Is it, um, you know, uh, enjoyment, etc. And so Based on those attributes, you know, there are multiple ways that people have gone in to identify their sound um, logo or their sound identity. And I think for me, the best ones are the ones that have started from a place of, um, you know, uh, heritage where they've looked back into what is the brand, uh, what is that the brand stands for, and how can that be translated into a message um, and so the reason why I use McDonald's example is that their journey started with a music song, right? Like, like a jingle. And that jingle had certain musical notes that felt right for the brand that they've used very consistently across their TV ads, their radio ads, um, et cetera. So I think they've spread that and they've used it consistently, which is why it's quite memorable. Um, there have been other approaches where brands can just, you know, create a sonic a, a set of tunes that actually works for them and invokes those emotions and you know today there is obviously access to a lot of uh, technology and ai for you to be able to assess um how did that sound make you feel you know and consistently evaluate that with consumers to make sure that your sound is hitting the right notes with consumers um so i think uh, there is a a broad spectrum of application for it um, and once you identify that tune that has the stretch uh, to go from a song to even uh, something as small as, you know, a you know, notification that you go get on your phone, um, I think it needs to have like that, uh, uh, that flexibility so that it can be integrated across multiple touch points. Like, for example, I'll take the example of Pepsi, right? Like you, if, if there is a sonic identity, um, you want it to be consistent, not just in your content, but even something as little as the sound the vending machine makes when, you know, you, you pop a can of soda out of it. So I think the applications are endless. Um, and I think the, the, the world is only going to become more audio uh, reliant as we evolve, um, you know, uh, as consumers and our consumption behavior evolves um, with less, you know, screen, uh, with screenless devices. Um, and, and I think that interaction will be more influenced by the sound more than anything else. You were talking about using AI to measure the impact of sonic branding. Tell me about that. Marketers do want to make sure that what they're doing has the best ROI, right? Like whatever you implement uh, is, is delivering ultimately what you want. And so what AI does, it, it helps to reduce that bias, right? Uh, from the process because music, audio, or for that matter, anything creative is quite subjective, right? And so it's extremely hard and time consuming to find the right 
set of notes <laughs> uh, that deliver that emotion consistently, that de deliver that feeling consistently. Um, and especially with global brands, it's extremely hard, right? Because you want to keep in mind the cultural nuances across different cultures and different uh, backgrounds. And so um, I think AI gives the ability for brands to assess the impact of those um, sound notes in a um, in a way to identify that it's consistently delivering on all those people and it's consistently evoking the right emotions. So, um, you know, there are a lot of testing methodologies um, out there where you can expose consumers to a bunch of different, um, you know, uh, executions of those musical mnemonics and uh, test what are the emotions that each one of them deliver you know, which one comes across as uh, more cool, which one comes across as evoking more trust and really identifying those parameters that you want to test in that testing in that, in that research, because you want to make sure that you're optimizing and perfecting it for the, for the way the brand sounds, right? Um, and, and just like brand logos, right? You launch one, you, you won't launch a new one every year. <laughs> you, you create something that has longevity. And so similarly for your sound logo to have that longevity, you want to make sure that it consistently is working and it's delivering. So I think, um, you know, having that ability with technology to evoke and to, um, you know, validate that, um, is, is something that, you know, I think we have the benefit to do today. So essentially you're doing it through a panel really you're going to each market and going does this does this uh bit of sound branding evoke trust or excitement or reassurance is that is, is it simple as that just playing it to people and and uh, collecting that data centrally or is there a is there another metric uh, that you would track uh, within advertising or content yeah, I think I think the way we've approached it is similar, right? Like I think we did a similar testing where we we exposed them to uh, to uh, the audio pieces and uh, really collected the responses to a bunch of questions based on our criteria, and so they 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 were um, you know able to uh, rank those questions based on a scale to understand and really the same question was asked to them in different ways to really gather a consistent answer because oftentimes it's hard to evaluate music um, and it's hard to evaluate that feedback um, you know in, in one setting. So repetition and going back to consumers after optimizing again and again and having multiple rounds of that refinement is really I think what's um, helped to perfect the, the sound logo. Uh, but really, yeah, I think the way we approach it to your point is as simple as, you know, exposing them to uh, the audio and then asking how they feel uh, about it on a bunch of those attributes that we care about as a brand that we want to eventually make sure that it's triggering the emotions that we want to trigger. So someone listening to this podcast who doesn't work for a Danone or a Pepsi or a, a Reckitt or an Apple or a McDonald's I could easily be persuaded by your argument but how do you suggest someone starts on an effective sonic identity journey my god that's such a marketing sentence isn't it oh my god um, <laughs> but hopefully that make, hopefully the question makes sense like how do you go from zero to getting somewhere meaningful what are the what are the steps someone could take today or tomorrow to to follow in your footsteps yeah yeah I think um for me like the best, the first best thing to do is to really make sure that you have all the fundamentals of your brand in a place where you are, you're happy and you're confident that you know your brand DNA, because that is really the foundation of anything really. And more important for sound, um, having that clarity of what your brand wants to represent and where it wants to go in the future. And once you have that foundation, you know, I would suggest like you can approach it much like you would approach a um, you know, a design exercise when you define a design language. And there are uh, a lot of good agencies out there that can help you in that journey um, and, uh, you know, be your partners in helping you think through sound because it's not something that I think marketers have been trained in doing. And it's certainly not, um, you know, something that everybody has been doing, um, you know, just like creating TV ads or social, um, you know, those things are more mainstream and every marketer is doing. This is certainly a skill that requires a little bit of expertise, especially with someone in music. So, um, you know, I would certainly say lean on a partner, an expert, 
um, was just trying to do everything yourself. Um, and I think, um, and I think there is, uh, it's going to be very, you know, uh, inspiring and, and fun. So really enjoy the process. You know, it's going to be frustrating at times because it's not easy <laughs> to crack a musical note, but I think the journey and how you get there is a story in itself. And so I think really enjoy the process because it's probably going to be the most fun thing you're ever going to do. <laughs> what a lovely way to finish. And I'm sorry that we have to finish, but uh, we, we, have, uh, we have other things to do. Um, but that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your insight. And I, I learned a lot about Tonic Branding. So thank you. I will definitely be saying a lot of those things in meetings to make myself sound far cleverer than I am. So if someone wanted to get in touch with you about your shiny new object or anything else, what would be the best way to do that? You know, I think I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I check messages all the time. So yeah, that would be the most preferred platform to reach out and feel free to do that. And what makes a brilliant outreach email to you on LinkedIn? You know, just be honest. Tell me really what you want to go for. You know, if it's just a casual conversation, I'm happy to chat. And, you know, if you really need my help with something, I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, but just, you know, let's be straightforward. <laughs> nice. Cool. Sonic, thank you so much. Yeah, it was so lovely. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Um, and yeah, good luck. And let's stay connected. Hi, just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.com dot net that's t-o-m at uh i'm not gonna bother spelling it anyway you'll work it out thanks so much <laughs>